Okay, for the exam, I would say approximately a third is going to be state changes, fundamentals of thermodynamics, so that includes basically single component systems, uh, phase transitions of single components, cycles, energy balances, entropy balances, all those types of things. That would be about a third. Uh, I would say then phase changes and, and sorry, multi-component, multi-phase equilibrium. So that would be vapor liquid, liquid liquid equilibrium, activity coefficient models, routes law, that'd probably be about a third. Phase diagrams and such, and then a third on stat mech topics. So two pages front and back, one hour exam on Wednesday. Homework is due today, I'll post the solutions first thing tomorrow morning, so everyone will have access to that. So homework's due at midnight. I'll <coughs> have office hours tomorrow so that we can answer any last minute questions. And then, sadly, that's the end of the semester. Okay, so if there's no other questions, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little about scattering theory. So I'm not going to go over the mathematics too much. I'd much rather just uh, <clears throat> focus a little bit on giving everyone an intuitive feel for how scattering actually occurs. So this all started by a father and son pair when they derived and demonstrated Bragg's Law. So Bragg's Law relates between uh, basically reflections of radiation. We'll talk about a little bit more on that. So here's the law. <clears throat> D corresponds to some characteristic crystal plane separation distance in your scattering material. This is the angle that you observe the reflection. N is an integer. And lambda is the wavelength of the radiation that's being used. In order to use this equation, two criteria have to be met. Okay, two criteria here. <clears throat> Number one is that the wavelength of radiation that you're using has to be significantly larger than the size of the particle that is being scattered. Second criteria is that the features that you're investigating <clears throat> have to be bigger than basically the wavelength of the radiation. Otherwise, this inverse sign is undefined. So, every type of radiation can be scattered. Ultrasound, visible light, uh, x-rays, neutrons, all of these follow the same adherence to Bragg's Law. So if you're working with, uh, for example, um, broadcasting, you would have to worry about scattering coming from, you know, atmospheric fluctuations on size orders of the microwave radiation or AM, FM radiation. So for x-rays, your wavelength that is typical is going to be approximately one angstrom. Problem is, we have this criteria here that the wavelength needs to be much, much more larger than the size of the scattered particle. 
The good thing is that x-rays are not scattered by the atom itself. They are scattered by the electron. The radius of an electron, which is not really an appropriate analogy, but we have something called the scattering length, which is the effective size of an electron in respect to how it scatters radiation. This is called the Thomson scattering length. Right, in fact, an electron as a classical particle doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. And so the idea of us knowing how big particles are is, in fact, based on scattering theory itself. So in this case, the electron radius is about 2.8 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, or in this case, 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5 angstroms. We have satisfied that criteria. <clears throat> For neutrons, same criteria. Wavelength is on the order of about one angstrom. And again, the size of the scattering particle in the case of neutrons is the nucleus. And the nucleus is very, very small. on the order of about uh, 1 to 15 femtometers. So why this criteria matters? <clears throat> this is so we can have an isotropic scattering criteria. And this is really underlying the foundations of diffraction theory. So we have a wave. In fact, we have a planar wave. And one of the ways that we should actually think about how radiation is propagated is in the idea of wavelets. So the notion about how a wave propagates is that every single one of these is actually emitting in all directions. But the problem is, since all of these are emitting in the same direction, the only collective motion you get is going forward. So in the classical case of a single slit experiment, which we'll talk about, the only way that the radiation can get through is if this wavelet is the only one that passes. And then you have no longer any constructive and destructive interference from the waves above and below it. And you end up propagating a radial wave in the case of a point scattering instance. Has, has everyone seen a single slit diffraction experiment? I'm not willing to do it today. So this is the classic example of a single slit experiment where a lot of this wave particle duality for, for electrons was deduced. But the isotropic scattering is more general than that. If I have a particle here, let's say this is an electron, and I have radiation, in this case x-rays, with a characteristic wavelength. That's not the wavelength, but uh, that's the wavelength there. <laughs> <clears throat> what happens is if I have isotropic scattering, that means equal in all directions. So that way, the scatter radiation might go there, might go there, might go there, might go there, right? It has an equal probability of being scattered in every which way. So the effective thing that happens is that a planar wave is converted to a radial wave. And this happens at every point in space for a system that satisfies these criteria. So mathematically, how we write that <clears throat> is that we have a planar wave and then it is transitioned into a radial wave. 
this criteria B is the amplitude is the amplitude of the radial wave. Uh, K is equal to the wave number or the wave vector. And I is just the imaginary I. <clears throat> so recall that we can write uh, this is Euler's formula or Euler's equation. Right, e to the i is actually a way of expressing sines and cosines in a mathematically super more convenient way. So, <clears throat> all of scattering theory lie, basically corresponds to this relatively straightforward concept. The amplitude of the radial wave, we call this, this is related to the scattering cross section. Or, let me get the, <clears throat> let me get this right here. This is the uh, scattering length. Effectively what this is, probability, probability to scatter. So in the case of x-rays, The more electrons you have in a particular atom, the higher that atom's scattering length is going to be, which means the higher the probability it has to scatter electrons. Sorry, scatter x-rays. For neutrons, There is no correlation between the z number of an element and its scattering length. So in the case of x-ray diffraction or x-ray crystallography, if I'm looking at a biomolecule like DNA, which I hope to have an example of today, but I broke the part that we want to look at. Uh, who, who's familiar with the structure of DNA? What element has the most electrons in DNA? Is it hydrogen? No. Nitrogen. Nitrogen has a lot. Oxygen has some. Carbon, but carbon, hydrogen. So carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are what? Six, seven, and eight. Not too much more. Phosphorus. Phosphorus. The phosphorus backbone. I think phosphorus is in the thirties or something like that. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. Oh, you guys are kind of up your own table, <laughs> right? So most of the scattering from DNA will come from the phosphorus because of this principle. So with neutrons. Because there's no correlation between the Z number and the scattering length, this is actually a good thing. Because with x-rays, if I have something like phosphorus in my sample, or heaven forbid, like uh, if I'm trying to look at a, uh, a thin organic film on a gold nanoparticle, there's about a 0% chance you're going to see that. right? Because the gold is going to scatter like bonanzas, and the carbon on the surface is not going to scatter hardly at all. It's going to be there, but you won't be able to see it. In the case of neutrons, because there's no correlation between the Z number and its scattering length or cross section, then that means that we can actually see unique, cool features within the system itself. And what this also allows us to do is to substitute hydrogen for deuterium. And that allows us to get more information because the same material will have the same diffraction pattern, but you can tune the probability of getting different features to occur or disappear. So, 
what I want to do now is just go over with as limited mathematics as possible the idea of how this all works. So if I have a planar wave, and I have a periodic lattice, and this works even if it's not periodic, the only thing that you need is you need some heterogeneities in the system. If everything is 100% uniform, then everything looks exactly the same. So what's effectively going on, by satisfying the criteria that we have isotropic scattering events, the probability for any single particle in the system to scatter the radiation is defined by its scattering length, which defines the amplitude of that wave. Because right? so we have to imagine this, any single event right, is a random happenstance which direction it goes. But if it's continuously irradiated, then effectively you can integrate all of these random probability events and say it's an effective radial wave going out of the system. So what's happening then is that we have a periodic array and I'm going to try and draw the peaks and troughs. And I'm nowhere close to matching the wavelength of this here probably, I'm sure. But what's effectively happening then in diffraction experiments is that every single point where there's an atom or a scattering particle is emitting a radial wave. The amplitude of those radial waves is dependent on what the element is and what the type of radiation is. The constructive and destructive interference from the peaks and troughs lining up manifests itself in Bragg's Law. This is the criteria where the peaks and troughs line up. And one thing I forgot to mention is that this scattering theory was first published in 1913, I think for zinc chloride crystal. I sometimes cite that paper in some of my papers <clears throat> and proposals. And the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1915 for that discovery. So really quick turnaround. This is the early days of the Nobel Prize Committee as well, so they were trying to figure out now there's some scientific backlog of it. So William Bragg, uh, he is the youngest person to ever win the Nobel Prize in physics. And we want to venture a guess at how young William Bragg was when he won the Nobel Prize. 24. 25. Very close. So sadly to say, I'm past my prime and I'm an old timer now. So. <clears throat> For those of you over the age of 25, don't fret. There are still lots of important contributions to be made. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is just jump ahead right now. So first of all, this criteria holds true for any type of scatter radiation. This is effectively the fundamental underlying principles. Now I have racked my brains, uh, racked my brain trying to better understand the exact physics of how scattering occurs. And I bet if you ask 90% to 95% of phys physicists, they don't have a good concrete explanation either. So these analogies here, where we talk about scattering length as effectively a probability to scatter, that's because we don't really know the underlying mechanism. Maybe somebody does. But effectively, it just happens. And it, because it happens, this is the manifestation of what it is. We don't know how to predict these properties. So when it comes to neutrons, and we don't know whether how carbon is expected to scatter versus oxygen versus nitrogen. There are some theories, I think, that connect a small subset, but the overall collection of all, I don't know how many elements there are, lots of elements, uh, we just have to measure them. X-rays, it's trivial because more X-rays, more electrons and things like that. If, you have, if the X-ray energy is higher than the absorption energy of the element, then then uh, this, this criteria holds true. If the X-ray energy is on the order of that, then it doesn't. But this is ultimately what we're talking about here. Now, <clears throat> mathematically, I'm going to give you the governing equation for scattering theory. So this is the wave function of the scattered radiation. 
What we care about is not the wave function. We can't see wave functions. All we can see is the complex conjugate of wave functions. So we take the complex conjugate of the wave function. The reason for this is we don't know positive versus negative potential in a wave, right? So if this is a photon, there's no probability of the photon being here, high probability of the photon being here, no probability of the photon being there. But I don't know if this is a positive photon or a negative photon. All that my eyes can see and all that detectors and sensors can see is the complex conjugate. And that's why when we deal with I in complex numbers when we talk about wave theory is because it all goes away. Base that I is important to define the phase of the wave, but ultimately we lose that information when we actually detect radiation. Right? We can only see the complex conjugate of it. This capital I with the circle, that is the uh, magnitude or the flux of the radiation coming in. I erased it very silly. I should have kept it. Uh, my my, my uh, radial wave, where is that? So this is the formula for a radial wave. Notice it's 1 over r, but we all know the well-known law of inverse squares. So as we take the complex conjugate, that's where we get the law of inverse squares. Then what we do is we sum up for all the particles in the system. They have a scattering length. Lambda. Very bad lambda is what that is. So the last thing that we'll define is something called the structure factor. Effectively, all that it is is if we normalize this out and we restructure it a little bit. And the structure factor is also equal to a Fourier transform of the radial distribution function. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> Two more definitions here really quickly, and then we are done with the math. Okay, 
So sigma is what we call the cross section. So basically, if you take a scattering length and you square it, that gives you an area. So the analogy we use in scattering theory is that this is a cross section. Right? So it's effectively what the shadow is cast by a scattering particle. Uh, this capital omega is something we call the solid angle. So a solid angle is something that's important to understand for graphics and visualization. So for example, that uh, light switch over there, when I look at it, it's like, eh, yay big. Right? If I get far enough away, I won't be able to see it. Now the size of that hasn't changed. But the further away that I get, the smaller its solid angle gets. So when you're trying to visualize or see something, you say, hey, what's the smallest something a human can see with their eye? It's really defined based on what is the solid angle that people can differentiate. And so this is just a way that, that normalizes out the fact that a detector might be over there or the detector is here. The solid angle is constant, regardless of the angle and the position. So effectively, all scattering theory boils down to this is not part of the equation, sorry, is that all we're doing is we're adding up all of the different radial waves emanating from the different atomic positions. So you don't have to remember the math too well, but this is effectively what we're talking about when it comes to scattering theory. And so one of the key questions that I always like to ask, and if I wasn't so rushed this morning, I probably would have been more coherent with it, is basically how do we know that benzene looked like benzene before we could visualize it with an AFM? How do we know what water looked like? How do we know what the bonding structure of propane was? The answer for the most part is, well, some chemists were clever, and they could figure out that the elements were always in the same ratios, and they kind of deduced that this is how they should bond. Right? They kind of knew that based on the ratios of elements in carbon and hydrogen, they already kind of figured out how many bonds carbon has to hydrogen under different circumstances. But truth be told, the majority of materials we learned their structure by diffraction theory and by scattering. So scattering itself is kind of this prolific uh, uh, discipline where people just refer to scattering, like, oh, scattering, you know. Right? It's, it's that, that sort of, a, um, of appeal. And for basically the past 100 years, it's been the best way that we can deduce structures down on the atomic scale. Now we've got really fancy AFMs and scanning tunneling microscopes and things like that. But back in the day, this was the way that we figured out how things worked. But here's the, this is the key, right? This is the conceptual physics that I want everyone to understand. Scattering is manifested by having different waves, radial waves, emanating from different positions with different amplitudes, and you'll just happen to get constructive and destructive interference if the radiation is much larger than the wavelength or the size of the particles. That is directly related one-dimensionally, but you can do it three-dimensionally too. This is a one-dimensional uh, comparison to the radial distribution function. So if you know the radial distribution function, you can calculate the diffraction pattern. And vice versa, if you know the diffraction pattern, you can calculate the radial distribution function. Any questions before we go on? And I will attempt my demonstration. 